Well, good afternoon. We'd like to welcome everyone to the CBMHR Community Engagement Core December Seminar titled The Pursuit of Ideal Weight, Achieving Your Healthy Body. And we'd like to thank our speaker here today, Dr. Boltz, who will be joining us and talking a little bit about what it means to pursue the ideal weight and a healthy body. So before uh, we move forward, I'll go ahead and just have a word from the Community Engagement Core. Texas Southern University's Center for Biomedical and Minority Health Research Community Engagement Corps is funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Center for Minority Institutions Program. The CDC works directly with communities to identify health-related concerns and reduce health disparities related to minorities. We provide health education in partnership with health care federally qualified health centers, community and faith-based organizations. For more information, visit us on social media at CEC Texas Southern U or give us a call at 713-313-1233 or send us an email at cbmhrcommunity at tsu.edu. All right, so again, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We do ask that you remain muted throughout the presentation because there will be a Q&A session at the end. And while Dr. Boltz is speaking, you can also post your questions in a Q&A box during the presentation. We do ask that everyone uh, please complete a survey for today's seminar. So the link uh, to the English and the Spanish version will be made available in the chat. And we'll also make that link available at periodic times throughout the presentation as well. So again, welcome to our December seminar with Dr. Uh, Isha Voltz, who will be talking with us about the pursuit of ideal weight and what it means to achieve your healthy body. Dr. Voltz is the director of Texas Southern University's Campus Recreation and a proud alumna having graduated from the university with a Bachelor of Science in Health and Kinesiology. She earned a Master of Science in Sports Management and Medicine from the United States Sports Academy and received her doctorate in Education Leadership Management at Capella University. She's been with Campus Rec for 19 years and the last 12 as director. She's accountable for the department's strategic vision, fiscal control, and long-term planning, as well as consistently expanding the campus rec's reach and relevance. Uh, she's established herself as a nationwide expert in the campus recreation industry, and as a result of her involvement and active membership in the National Intramural and Sports Association, where she has spoken at conferences, workshops, of the importance of campus recreation at HBCUs and her particular interest in leadership development. She's published articles in Campus Rec magazines, a magazine where she's a contributing expert and she ascribes to the tagline, fitness is more than exercise, it's a way of life. So Dr. Boltz, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and just wanna say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Boats. Start sharing my screen. So today I will be presenting on maintaining a healthy weight. So we can go ahead and get started. So the first thing we need to discuss is what is determine a healthy weight? So a healthy weight is the number that is associated with the low risk of weight-related diseases and health issues. Um, it's important to understand that each person's healthy weight range will vary, and it depends on factors such as your age, the sex, genetics, body frame, your existing medical history, lifestyle habits, and your weight as a young adult. One of the methods that is utilized to measure the standardized weight or the healthy weight for, for your person is what we call the body mass index or BMI. This uh, method measures your weight to height ratio. And utilizing that specific calculation, it determines 
based off of that calculation is used to measure how risk you are at within your health. Before we go into the details of more in details with the body mass index, let's take a step back and talk about the elephant in the room, body fat. Body fat is basically everybody's arch nemesis. Regardless of what part of your body that you feel like you do not like or you see in the mirror, it's that fat piece, we gotta get rid of it, we gotta lose it. But it's important to also understand the, the role of body fat as it pertains to your body. Fat, for one, provides energy when food is scarce. So when you are not eating adequately, or let's say you did not eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, those type of things, your body reacts. And that's when your fat cells kick in and your fat cells start to find nutrients throughout your body, okay? Fat releases hormones that influence metabolism, your hunger and insulin sensitivity. So when you are hungry, when you start getting those urges, that's the hormones that are being released. Fat cells also secrete proteins and build enzymes involved with your immune functions. And also it's important to understand that fat multiplies. So when we think about fat, you need to know that the amount of fat cells that are in your body is actually determined after birth and during your adolescence. And it also stays consistent throughout your adult if your weight stays consistent. Okay, so over time, as you grow and come in adulthood, things change, your body change for whatever reason, reasoning, too many calories for one can cause fat cells to multiply and be stored throughout the body to um, develop new fat cell formations. So that's when we go back to the um, you as an adolescent or the weight that you were as a teenager going up to young adulthood to now as a full grown adult, that's how your weight can fluctuate if it's not maintained throughout your years. Now, going back to what we talked about, the body mass index, the measuring of your body fat. BMI is a good tool to estimate the excess fat within your body. It calculates and ratios, like we stated, the weight to height. However, it does have its limitations. It can't measure the actual location of the fat, such as belly fat is linked with greater health risk. So it cannot differentiate where the fat is located. It's just giving you a general overview of based off of your weight to your height. This is the standard. This is where you're at as it pertains to when we're looking at that chart, if you're at the normal obese underweight, those type of categories. And also it's important to um, consider things that are that you're contribute that can contribute to your weight. We talked about the age, your sex, race, and ethnicity can also affect your um, BMI. Women genetically have more body fat and less muscle mass than men. Studies also have shown that black people with the same BMI, have less body fat and greater lean muscles. So common knowledge or common record shows that Blacks and Hispanics have the highest obesity rates in the US. So the disease burden is a bit higher. That also can um, determine the culture um, that you was raised within or that culture as a, as a whole, as it comes to how we eat and things such as that. Now we look at how do we determine our BMI? We actually can measure our own BMIs at home or wherever you are. So the best way to do that, you want to divide your weight into pounds by your height in inches. So you wanna divide the answer by your height in inches. Then you will multiply the answer by 703. So once you get that number, you then want to interpret what that means. So based off the World Health Organization, 
it defines a normal weight for a BMI will be a measure of 18.5 to 24.9. That will be considered normal. Overweight or pre-obesity is measured at 25 to 29.9. And then obesity is anything that measures 30 or higher. At a population level, that's what we're looking at, just a general population, not the individual. So when you measure yourself, it's based off of a general population or the general overview of an ind not the individual. So at a population level, a high BMI is generally associated with an increased risk of disease and early death. So many studies have shown that a BMI above 25 increases the chances of dying early compared to those with normal weight. Also, we're talking about weight gain. Anything less than 18.5 is, is underweight. Other methods that are used when measuring is waist circumference. So some re researchers consider waist circumference to be a better measuring of unhealthy body fat than BMI, as it addresses the visceral abdominal fat. So when measuring utilizing the waist circumference method, you wanna wear thin clothing or no clothing at all, stand up straight and wrap a flexible measuring tape around your midsection, laying the tape flat so it crosses your navel belly button. The tape should be snug, but not pinched too tightly around the waist. And you want to inhale and exhale normally, do not hold your breath. You can repeat the measurements two to three times to ensure a consistent reading. So after you get that reading, a waist size larger than 40 inches for men and 35 inches for women increases the chances of developing heart disease, cancer, and other chronic diseases. Now the question, the most popular question for men and women, how do I get rid of belly fat? Unfortunately, guys, doing extra sit-ups or drinking apple cider vinegar won't help spot tone this area. Losing weight can help though, okay? So people tend to lose weight uniformly rather than in one location. So that means that you cannot differentiate between your whole body when you're working out. So you cannot spot select your body. Like I just want to lose my belly, but I want to keep everything else. That's not how your body reacts, okay? So when you're working out, it's, tar it's targeting your whole body as a whole, okay? So for long-term commitment, the best thing is to do is following an exercise guideline, along with eating a balanced portion control meals. This can help reduce dangerous visceral fat, which is known as the belly fat, okay? The next slides, we will go in more details about nutrition. So the best diet is quality, meaning does quality counts? So instead of just considering calories, I know everybody understands counting calories and a certain amount of calories you should consume, but also we need to consider the quality of the foods that we are eating with those calories. Okay, so strongest evidence to date shows that calories matter, but focusing on food quality is an equally important part of preventing weight gain and promoting weight loss. So we wanna focus on eating high quality foods in appropriately sized portions. So we're gonna talk more in detail about what, are, what is considered high quality foods. So high quality foods are considered unrefined, minimally processed foods such as vegetables and fruits, whole grains, healthy fats, and healthy sources of protein, okay? Generally looking at the healthy eating plate overall, this is something that we um, cohesively should follow as a guideline when you're deciding your eating methods. You want to use healthy oils like olive and canola oil for cooking or salad and at the table. Limit your butter and avoid trans fat. The more vegetables and the greater the variety, the better. Potatoes and french fries don't count. And you want to eat plenty of fruits of all colors. You want to drink water, tea, or coffee with little or no sugar. You wanna limit your milk and dairy at least to one or two servings a day and juice one small glass a day. 
you want to try as much as possible to avoid sugary drinks. So eat a variety of whole grains like whole wheat bread, whole grain pasta, and brown rice. You wanna limit your refined grains like white rice and white bread. And also you want to choose fish, poultry, beans, and nuts, and limit the red meat and cheese. And also you want to avoid that bacon and cold cuts and other processed meats as much as possible. We wanna talk about lower quality foods cause they do exist. This include processed snack foods, sugar sweetened beverages, refined white grains, refined sugar, fried foods, food high in saturated and trans fat and high glycemic foods such as potatoes. So as we talk about quality, does it count? A study of over 120,000 healthy women and men spanning over 20 years, researchers determined that weight change was mostly associated with intake of potato chips, potatoes, sugar sweetened beverages, and both processed and unprocessed foods, which resulted in increased weight gain. Foods shown to be associated with weight loss were vegetables, whole grains, fruits, nuts, and yogurt. So in conclusion, the best diet incorporates high quality foods in appropriate portions. There isn't one perfect diet for everyone. A healthy diet for weight loss, loss also needs to be sustainable. And regardless of what you're eating, you need to make sure you're not eating too many calories overall. So calories do matter. So the overall principle of weight control is a balance between intake how much you bring into your body and expenditure, how much you burn and release from your body. So just a general guideline, the more intake and less expenditure equals weight gain. If the intake equals the expenditure, that's the maintaining of the weight. If the intake is less than the expenditure, that's weight loss. So the common grounds is one pound of fat equals 3,500 calories. So the maximum weight loss should be no more than one to two pounds per week. So if you are burning 500 calories a day at seven days a week, that equals 3,500 calories per week. That's one pound. If you're burning 1,000 calories a day at seven days a week, equals 7,000 calories a week. That's two pounds loss. And then vice versa, if you wanted to gain weight that you're consuming that amount of um, calories. Now we're gonna talk more into staying active, the main process of maintaining, losing or gaining weight. So the types of exercise that we normally consist of is our aerobic cardiovascular. That's anything that's getting your heart rate up, getting your heart pumping from its normal regular um, rhythm. So examples of these are walking, jogging, dancing, bicycling, basketball, soccer, swimming, anything that's taking your heart up a notch from its normal stance. Then we talk about our muscle strengthening activity. This is anything that involves weights, lifting, or the usage of your muscles. So examples are the weight machines, free weights, resistance, elastic bands, doing Pilates, daily activities of living, even if you're not in the gym, lifting your children, carrying groceries or laundry, climbing stairs. And then finally, we have our flexibility. Anything that's elongating our muscles to out of its normal range. These examples are dynamic stretches, when we're doing arm raises, things like that. Um, performing things such as yoga, Tai Chi and our static stretches when we're doing toe touches, things that's without any movement, just staying in one place and stretching our bodies. These three factors are important when you're starting an exercise regimen. Adults should move more frequently throughout the day and sit less. The older you get, the more movement you should do. You should engage in at least 150 to 300 minutes weekly, spaced throughout the week. 
Um, you wanted to consume moderate intensity aerobic exercise and at least two days weekly of muscle strengthening exercise. So greater health benefits may be seen with more than 300 minutes weekly of exercise. You want to include frequency, duration, and intensity, which is how often you work out. The duration, how long you work out. And intensity, how much energy are you putting out when you are working out, okay? The common regimen you want to do, how often, at least when you're starting, three to four hours, I mean, I'm sorry, three to four days a week. How long, you want to at least be 15 to an hour, 60 minutes. And then intensity is from light, from, from beginners, all the way to vigorous for two athletes and those that are highly advanced workouters. It is, it is important when you're starting an exercise regimen or remaining an exercise regimen, safety should be your major priority when exercising. So any physical activity carries the risk of injury, whether you are just starting an exercise regimen or like I said, a seasonal fitness buff you always wanna take in consideration that safety protocol when you're starting out. Some of the common missteps of starting a workout, not talking or consulting with your doctor first. If you have any kind of underlining health issues or this is your first time starting something new exercise, you want to consult with your physician first and foremost. It is important to get at least a physical um, if, you, if you do not go to a physician, it is most fitness centers, they have personal trainers where you can sign up for free fitness assessments just to test where your exercise level is and where you need to start. It is always good to consult with an expert before starting. Doing too much too soon. Again, when you're consulting and starting off with a fitness new regimen, it is important to talk to an expert that can get you started and get you on the right track because you can overexert yourself, you can underexert yourself. It's different levels that you can do when you're starting out. And leaving out the warm up and cool down. It is important to always have a warm up before you start any kind of exercise workout. A warm up is, is something that you start out like, for example, if you're on a treadmill, you wanna do a warm up, probably a quick 10 minute warm up at a walking speed a little bit higher than your normal walking just to get your heart rate and your blood flowing up to get ready for that exercise program that you are um, getting ready to perform. And then again, um, cool down. So once you go through your exercise regimen and you want to do that cool down, you wanna do the opposite. You wanna slow the heart rate back down to normal, doing stretches, going back to normal walking, just to get you back to your normal heart rate. So here are some 10 tips to keep moving. Plan exercise into your day. Number two, accountability helps. Number three, try counting steps. Four, keep it brisk. Five, turn off the TV, computer, and smartphone. Six, turn sit time into fit time. And seven, move at the office. Eight, split the workout. And nine, sign up for a class or a specific event. And then 10, reward yourself. So these are some 10 tips that will help you keep motivating yourself. I think the most important, important part is accountability. Always start with yourself. Always make yourself accountable for what you're doing. Do not force yourself. Do not do not start a workout regimen because you, it's time for a class reunion. You're about to go on a trip. Now it's time. It's a lifestyle change. It's really generally a lifestyle change and you have to be ready and you have to want it and it has to be for a purpose, okay? Another common factor that will consist in helping you maintain your healthy weight is stress. Stress is a common problem in most societies. There are three main types of stress that may occur in everyday lives. We have our acute stress, that's a brief event such as a heated argument or getting stuck in a traffic jam. We have our acute episodic stress, which is frequent acute events such as work, deadlines. And then we have our chronic stress, which is persistent events like unemployment from a job loss, 
physical or mental abuse, substance abuse, and family conflict. Stress and health problems. When stress is prolonged, a lot of times people are stressing and you do not know you're stressing. If you ever take time in a silent place and just breathe in and breathe out and you realize how tight you're really holding yourself, that is stress. And you might not even know that that is even happening throughout the day. So when you are dealing with stress, health problems can exist. And these are some of the known health, um, health problems that does exist when stress is not being um, taken care of. So we have our digestive issues such as heartburns, fatulence, diarrhea, constipation, weight gain, elevated blood pressure, chest pain, heart disease, immune system problems, skin conditions, muscular pain, sleep disruption, and insomnia, infertility, and anxiety. So some of these common things that occur it heartburns come, you just take it as, oh, I must have ate something. You might want to take time and just, am I stressing? Ask yourself those questions when simple things that happen on a daily basis, that can be cause of stress. When your body is not normally reacting to the normal daily operating of its system. Here are some tips to help control your stress eating a healthy diet, mindful eating. Mindful eating is very important. When you're eating lunch, dinner, breakfast, take the time to really chew and eat your food. A lot of people, in a, in because of society as usual, we're eating on the go. We always have something else that, that's more important. Let me hurry up and eat. And when you eat like that, you're not mindful that you're eating. So then now you're still hungry because you didn't take the time to chew and reflect on I'm eating, you know, things like that. Regular exercise, meditation, deep breathing techniques. That should be a daily task for you. Time you get up, just give 30 minutes just to lay, breathe in and out, reflect before you get hustle and bustle of your day. Mental health counseling or other social support. Practicing life work balance. I know that most people, we always say the term work-life balance, but it should be flipped around because your life is more important. So practicing life-work balance. Schedule fun activities or hobbies at least once a week. Do something that you love. Take yourself out of the norm and, and relax. And those are things that help control your stress, your level, and get you back to a level that you are wanting to be on. And then, of course, good sleep hygiene you want to have roughly eight to nine hours of sleep. Key lifestyle factors as we grow older. These are the factors that we have to maintain throughout our lives. That's our healthy diet, regular exercise, healthy weight, not smoking, moderate alcohol, having life purpose meetings, social connections, and brain stimulation. These are the things that are key lifestyle factors throughout our entire life as we go through this cycle. And that concludes my presentation on maintaining a healthy weight. And thank you for your time. And now I'm open for any questions and answers that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Volz. We appreciate the presentation. I'm looking here. I've been putting some things in the chat, and I don't see anyone with a question just as yet. But I will tell you, listening to all of the information that you shared, I, I can't thank you enough. I want to say I have a question. So for me, um, as, as an African-American woman, um, I, at some point in my life, decided to make myself feel good by thinking that the BMI tool wasn't made with people like myself in mind. And so that means I shouldn't even worry about it. So I, it sounds like I may be way off track. Yes and no. The reason why I say yes, I would say generally speaking, most of these charts, most of these uh, categories that are placed, it is based off of a white male age 25. 
And then from there, they differentiate. So we do have those tools are very important to give us a starting point for where we are and who we are. But it also you want to take in consideration you individually, meaning knowing your starting weight when when you was young, knowing your activity level from when growing up. So you factor those things in. You also take in the culture of an African American woman, African American in general. We we tend to be a little bit more thicker skinned than our counterparts. So you do take those factors in place. So those me those measurements does work to give you a foundation. But you also got to consider start putting in your individual needs and in where you feel that you need to be based off of that healthy uh, results. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. So it's okay. So now we have a question. And so how can we read labels when it comes to counting calories? So when reading the labels, um, pretty much what they have now with the labels on pretty much all of the products, they have the breakdown of the calories. They give you the total number of calories that this specific um, product represents. So that is the number of, let's say if it's a servings of one. So a serving, one serving is basically you want, you measure measured at into a cup. So that's one serving if you're eating popcorn, if you're eating chips, that's considered one serving. So if they're saying the calories based off of one serving, that's what you calculate. Now, if you go back and get two servings, three and four, you got to add those calories. So the, the um, total is always based on the one serving. Now, if you're looking at one product like an apple, what that calorie represent, that one calorie for that apple, that's what you would add in. That's how much you consume. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I, and, and then thinking about mindless eating and how that plays a role in you still being hungry later. I, I never associated that together. That was interesting to hear. Yes. Thank, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. So let me see. I, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now or in the Q&A. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll take over the screen. Dr. Okay. Bowles, thank you so much. And thank if anything you. else comes up, I'll be sure to bring it up. Please do. Thank you again. This is a great presentation. I have one question, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. is personal. I'm struggling with weight management and time, like you mentioned. Um, give yourself time to chew because we're always in the run uh, trying to get things done. And then I see a lot of people with um, hypertension and diabetes. What do you recommend, especially with uh, people with diabetes, overweight, um, trying to manage the diet? Uh, what are the recommendations, food especially, they can consume? Thank you. I would say recommendations with um, anyone that has uh, underlying ailment is you have to have make time for movement because a lot of the issues is the consumption of the, the food or things that you're taking in and not the expenditure. So you have to burn that out because when, when the things that you're digesting, if it's not coming out or burning out, is it festers and it stays in. And that's, that's what um, triggers those other ailments that, that can um, exist. So movement is, more, is definitely important. You want to get at least 30 minutes of some kind of movement. If you're in an office, just get up and jumping jacks, whatever you want to do. It's, it's a lot of things that you can do or just be mindful and conscious of when you're walking to the restroom, when you're, when you're walking to your car, when you're walking up the stairs, you take those extra movements, do some extra steps. Those things are, are uh, very important that you don't really take, be conscious of. So a lot of the things when it comes to maintaining a healthy weight or any of the things is the mind first. You got to overcome the mind because when you, you already defeated yourself when you said, I don't have no time. You have time. You have time. We have a lot of time in the day, but we consume it with so much other things that 
doesn't matter when we talk about our health. So then that's when you want to, that's where the life work balance come in. Right. You want to put in that time of when you have your lunch break, you only should think about your lunch break. But a lot of people think about, okay, I got my lunch, but I got to go back to the office because I got to make this phone call. And then when I leave, I got to go to the grocery store. And then, you know, you're, you're doing all these things when you're supposed to be your lunch break. So right. it's important to be in the moment. And, and just going back to, to the ailment, some things that I do, because I'm not a big eater, when it comes to nutrition and things like that, I'm kind of unconventional myself. So it's hard for me to, to give those, those um, examples as, as most people, because everybody has to find their own path. But what I found for me, because I'm not a big eater when it comes to breakfast, I, I, I just, I'm just not hungry. What I do is I, you still need those nutrients. I'm a big herbal tea drinker because it already have natural herbal tea. So it already have those nutrients that's in your body. You can do things like smoothies. Um, we talk about um, what I said, herbal teas, anything that have nutrients in your body just to get your body flowing. A good thing to do early in the morning is uh, just a warm cup of water and a squeeze of lemon. That right there triggers your body to flow and function. The thing about your body is it's going to do what it's going to do. It's up to us to aid and help it do what it's going to do. If you're not eating properly, it's going to find ways to protect itself by the fat. Now the fat's going to come and eat where it needs to eat and preserve and help and the organs, whatever it needs to do to keep it going. But it's our job to feed it. It's our job to nutrient and keep it doing, helping it do what it has to do. This is really awesome answer. Thank you so much because I've been going to my doctor's office. All I hear is uh, watch, maintain your diet, but I don't know how what to is that? it. I don't know what is that. So thank you. One okay. thing I would say, like just to start off, because I never tell people like certain foods to eat, things like that, whatever you're eating. If, 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 if you're a huge snacker, bring it down a notch. Just don't eat as much as you did. Like continue to eat the things that you eat until you naturally wing yourself off of it, but don't eat as much of it. You know, those type, those type of things. If you know that you're, you want to lose weight, lessen the cal lessen the things that you are doing now. And you will, you will start seeing those changes just by taking those small steps. It's baby steps. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You work with your body, listen to your body. Thank you very much. Really appreciate this. You're welcome. And, and Dr. Volz, we've got a couple of uh, attendee members who wanted to give you some comments here. And they say, thank you for this informative webinar. Uh, they really like the rephrasing line, life work balance. Thank so they you. say, thank you for that. And then another person said, they really like the statement, make sit time, fit time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for giving those uh, that tidbit of information and I appreciate the the perspective you shared about it because I it can get overwhelming sometimes when you think about what all you need to do but it sounds like you're saying you can just take a gentle compassionate harm reduction approach yes. to to improving your head and weight and I love that so it's like you don't have to just give up everything but just slowly start to kind of, you know, just make it a little smaller each time and it's progress. The thing is, you don't want to add on to your burdens. You don't want to add on to the frustration that you're already feeling about yourself. You just want to be conscious and aware of the, that you're ready for a change and then start making those little changes from where you're starting it now. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Well, let me see if there's anything else in a QA, and a and I don't see well, anything I don't else. See any more questions. Okay, so I'll go back and share my screen. So we can uh, close out with a few upcoming announcements and events on behalf of the Community Engagement course. So once again, if you have not ready, uh, please complete the survey in the chat box and just give us your feedback and let us know what you think and what you'd like to see more of. Um, we also have an upcoming 
a monthly seminar, which will be held January 28th, uh, approximately from 10 to 2 p.m. It's an in-person outreach event. It'll be held at J.D. Walker Community Center. And the focus will be on uh, mothers, maternal health, their children. Our goal is to provide the, some resources, supplies, quality information about how to improve your maternal health. And so this is open to everyone, all community members uh, and supporters and loved ones as well. Come on out and join us. Next, we have a maternal child health focus group that'll be taking place tomorrow, actually at 10 a.m. of the Zoom. And so here the goal is to kind of just talk about some more the, the dis health disparities that we're seeing amongst our black and brown women um, and just kind of share experiences. We certainly like to, you to consider putting on your calendar the upcoming clinical research and engagement conference, which will be held April 22nd, 2023. This will be on a Saturday. Um, and we are planning to have this in person and also stream live. So previously, um, we've always had it virtually. So this will be our first time having it in a hybrid session. So we hope you all consider joining us and it'll be at Texas Southern University. Monday, December 5th, we have our upcoming Community Connect Forum. This is where we like to connect with our partners, our CEC partners and community members so we can share about the information and things that we're doing in our organizations. A lot of us are doing similar work. And so sometimes it's just good to come together and tell us what you're doing, uh, what you're looking for, if you need anything. And maybe we can kind of work together to make those things happen. So consider joining us. It'll be virtual. Um, and the Zoom link, um, it should have went out already already uh, via our, our listserv. And then also we would like, we are proud to um, announce that the Community Engagement Corps is offering its first Community Impact Grant. Uh, with this grant in partnership with AFLAC, so we give thanks for AFLAC, uh, in partnership with them, we'll be able to offer one to two uh, community-based grants to individuals, or organizations who want to propose a project for a specific disparity related social determinant of health in your project. Um, and so the RFA will be made available December 9th um, with applications due in January. So this is just kind of a save the date. If you're interested or just wanna get a little bit more information, know that we'll be putting that out on the 9th. But if you have questions, more questions in specific, please feel free to email the CEC so we can give you that information here. But you'll see here that the um, it's about promoting health equity. Um, we will have one to two projects at anywhere between five to $10,000. Um, the final submission date will be January 13th. And the project performance period will run from March until November of 2023. So we're really excited about that. We hope this is something that we can continue over time. And then finally, as always, we ask that you please consider following us on our social media. You can email us or you can also visit our website to keep up to date with the things that we're doing as well as previous seminars. So once uh, we complete this, Dr. Volz's presentation about doing healthy weight will be made available on our CEC website. So this concludes our December seminar presentation. And we wanna thank everyone for your attendance here today. And we ask again, please to complete the survey. Um, and that way you can, we can know what you want. Thank you so much.